This is going to be verse by verse of Hebrews chapter 6. So uh, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Therefore, living the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So the doctrines of Christ, these would be things like the virgin birth, the sinlessness of Jesus Christ, the deity of Jesus Christ, the resurrection, the humanity, and the blood of Jesus Christ. So it says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. In chapter 5, Paul was talking about men not being able to handle the strong meat of the word of God. And at the beginning of chapter 6, he says, therefore. So this shows that it's a continuation of what was said in chapter 5. So he's saying, let's leave the principles of the doctrines of Christ. He's saying, let's put the basic milk of the word down for a minute here, and let's get deeper in the book. Many people talk about being a fundamentalist. But you should be a Bible believer first and foremost, and not only stick to the fundamentals. And an even better word than fundamentalist is foundationalist. He says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. So you should know the foundations of Bible doctrine backwards and forwards and be able to move on into something a little bit deeper. If you have been saved a while, then you shouldn't need to leave. You shouldn't need to have the foundation laid again. You should have it already laid out there for you in your mind. And know what someone's talking about when they mention the things like the deity of Jesus Christ and the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. If you don't have a good foundation of the Bible in your mind, then you need to start now. That way, in a few years, you can say, we don't have to lay the foundations again. There's nothing wrong with going back over things you already know, but you shouldn't have to always have someone teaching you the basic things, such as that that, it says in verse 1, repentance from dead works. But in case you don't know, I mean, it's fine if you don't know. But when you get saved, you repented from dead works. You realized your own dead works could not save you, and you turned to Jesus Christ who did the work on the cross to save you. When it comes to gaining your salvation, your works are dead works. And when you got saved, you were, whether you realized it or not, when you came to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and believed on Jesus Christ, you were acknowledging that your own goodness, your own works that are dead works are not good enough to get you to heaven. You realized that those works could not give you righteousness, but that Jesus Christ would. So you should already know that. Really, you should. If you don't, you know now. You should know verses that show you that your own works cannot save you. The church of Christ doesn't know that. The holiness preacher doesn't know that. The Catholic doesn't know that. This means they can't even grasp the milk. They don't even have a foundation. They're not a foundationalist. Hebrews 6.2 of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. So do you know these basic things that are just milk, not meat? The Church of Christ obviously doesn't understand the doctrine of baptisms, as it says there in verse 2. There is more than one baptism in the Bible, even though there is only one baptism which saves. The one that saves has nothing to do with being immersed in water. That has to do with you... This salvation or this baptism which saves has to do with you being baptized into jesus christ the moment that you believed and you didn't even know what happened because it has nothing to do with water it happened and you didn't even know it, it says in first corinthians twelve thirteen, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body whether we be jews or gentiles whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit in Matthew 3.11, you have three different baptisms in just one verse. Matthew 3.11, it says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. This is John talking, and that is John's baptism, which manifests Jesus to Israel. 
He, it goes on to say, But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Here you have the Holy Ghost baptism that we just mentioned in 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen, And then the baptism of fire has to do with being cast into the lake of fire. So there you have John's baptism, the spirit baptism, and the baptism of fire. That refers to a lost person getting put into the lake of fire. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, look at the next verse. It says, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into his garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Showing you, it has to do with the lake of fire. Right there you have three different baptisms in one verse, Matthew 3.11. In Acts 2.38, you have Peter preaching water baptism to the Jews because they just crucified their Messiah. It's a different baptism. In Acts 10, 47 through 48, Cornelius is baptized in water after he's saved. There's your believer's baptism for today, which is only a figure of the death, burial, and resurrection. In Matthew 20, 22, Jesus talks about the baptism of his death. In 1 Corinthians 10, 2, they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Once again, this has nothing to do with the other baptisms. It calls that a baptism when Moses and the children of Israel went through the Red Sea on dry ground. The water never touched them. Now Hebrews 6, 3, and this will we do if God permit. So you should always say, Lord willing. You'll only do something if God permits it. James four fifteen, For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So in this will we do, if God permit. He's going to take them on to some strong meat, Lord willing. Now, here's the strong meat. And this is one of the difficult passages for people today. A lot of people will use these verses to teach that a born-again Christian can lose their salvation and then go to hell. But I'm going to show you that that's not true. Hebrews 6, 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Paul is saying something is impossible. If you look down at verse 6, it shows you what is impossible. What's impossible is to renew certain people to repentance after they fall away. And I'll go ahead and tell you right now, that can't be us. Today, in the doctrinal sense, I can always come to the Lord in repentance. There isn't any sin I could commit today that God wouldn't let me confess it and put it behind me. So these verses, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, must apply doctrinally to a time when there is something out there that can cause a person not to ever be right with God again. And that is, the only thing you can really think of is in the tribulation. When a man takes the mark and worships the beast. Because in Revelation 14, 11, it says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Plainly teaching that a man who takes the mark of the beast goes to hell. So Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 is referring to a saint. But it can't be any saint Today, in this age we are in, we have eternal security, we can't lose our salvation, and there isn't any sin on this earth that God is saying that if we do it, we lose our salvation. There's not something that we can do that God will say, hey, you, you lose your salvation. If somebody put a microchip in you right now, you wouldn't lose your salvation. A lot of people say, well, the microchip's the mark of the beast. And maybe that will be the mark of the beast eventually one day, but it's not yet because we're not in the tribulation and we're not going through the tribulation. A lot of people act like you're going to go to hell if you wear a mask. And I admit putting a mask on, that is pretty stupid. How's that going to keep you from getting some type of deadly virus if there even really is one that's as deadly as they're saying it is? But still, though, if somebody was all about wearing a mask... You know, that's that's not going to make them lose their salvation. 
You know, all these things people come up with. But there's no threat of the mark of the beast today in this age we're in. You can't do something. You can't do any sin that will make God make you unsaved. There's no sin like that. It does, you could go out and get drunk and commit fornication and murder someone. And if you're truly saved, you won't lose your salvation. You'll pay for that in the flesh and you'll lose rewards, but once you're saved, you're always saved. So this is my views on the verse. One, a person doesn't have to accept my view to be right with God. I respect your view on the verses, so I hope you can ex accept my view on the verses. But here are the reasons why I believe the person in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 refers to a saint in the tribulation. And not just someone who was almost persuaded to be right with God. Because number one, they were once enlightened. I don't believe Hebrews 6 is referring to any born-again Christian in the church age. Rather, it is referring to a saint in the tribulation. It has to be. I'm gonna, And I'm going to tell you why. The first reason I believe this is referring to a true believer is because it says they were once enlightened. And in Ephesians 1.18, it calls a believer enlightened. In Ephesians 1.18, it says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of this calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Number two, it says they tasted of the heavenly gift. Some men say that they tasted of salvation, but they just didn't swallow it. And that sounds good and all, but if you search the word taste in the Bible, it will show you verses like Hebrews 2, 9, where it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So if Jesus Christ tasted death for every man, did he really not die? Did he not swallow it? I mean, he took it. So if he tasted death for every man, then the person in Hebrews 6 really tasted the heavenly gift and took it. Not just tasted, but took it. I mean, you can't just say that they just didn't get it. I mean, it said, if Jesus tasted death for every man and he really died, then the person who tasted the heavenly gift really got the heavenly gift. Now the next thing is, it says they were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. If someone is made partaker of the Holy Ghost, and they are obviously a saint. Is a lost man made partaker of the Holy Ghost? So this has to be someone in the tribulation time period who takes the mark, who at one point was once enlightened, tasted of the heavenly gift, was made a partaker of the Holy Ghost, and then it says in Hebrews 6, 5, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. So they tasted of the good word of God. Can a natural man really get the word of God? 1 Corinthians 2, 14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, and neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And then number five, tasted the powers of the world to come. Another reason I don't believe this is referring to any born-again believer in the church ages, because these people can taste the powers of the world to come. In Matthew 12, 32, when Jesus says, world to come, he's talking about the millennial kingdom. In Matthew 24, when Jesus Christ describes the end of the world, he's talking about this his current world system, and the millennium will be the world to come. And saints in the tribulation will taste of the powers of the world to come. They will possibly have the sign gifts that are associated with the preaching of the kingdom. They will literally taste the powers of the world to come. And you can read about those same gifts in Mark 16, 17 through 20. But it says in Hebrews 6, 6, If they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Doctrinally, this can apply to me. I'm all for looking at these verses and finding a way to apply to me practically that I can use the verses to help me 
live more righteous and, and pleasing God. But in the doctrinal sense, this isn't to me, just like it's not to me when you go to the Old Testament and someone is offering a bloody animal sacrifice. The same way that that's not directly to me. Listen, don't don't make me say something I'm not saying. I'm, I'm not saying that the Bible ain't for me because I can get something out of every bit of the Bible. I can go back there in the Old Testament and, and read about those sacrifices and I can apply something to me, but I can't apply it to me doctrinally. I'm not going to literally go out and offer an animal sacrifice because that's done away with. Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice. Now, I'm not going to go to Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 and say, well, if I do something bad, I'm going to lose my salvation because that's not to me. That contradicts what Paul said in his epistles. So this has to be for a different person in a different time. And if the only sin he can think of that would just automatically damn a man is if he takes that mark of the beast. And if they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, put into an open shame. So the next thing, number six, the, the fact that it says renew them again into repentance shows that they did actually repent already at one point. At one point, they did turn to God, but they did something, and now they can't be renewed unto repentance. If you're a Christian, there's nothing that you can do that God's going to look at you and say, you're unsaved, and he's not even going to look at you and say, well, you did this, and maybe you're still saved, but you, you can't confess your, that sin to me. I'm never going to forget it. No, that's never going to happen. Hebrews 6, 7, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. So you'll notice in the book of Joel it talks about a latter rain, which will happen at the end of the tribulation and the second coming. And this Hebrews 6, 7 says, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it. So this... There's a rain that's going to restore everything. In Joel 2, 23 and 25 through 25, it says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. So, that's what's going to happen. It says, For the earth which drinketh in the rain, that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meat for them, by whom it is dreath, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. So the people bearing thorns and briars get burned. Also second coming. That's also a second coming reference. Nahum 1.10, For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. Matthew 13.30 talks about it again. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. So those bearing the thorns and briars will be the ones a part of that baptism of fire, that is literal burning fire. Matthew 3, 12, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So at the end of the tribulation, you got the second coming. When Jesus Christ comes back, and, I mean, he's, he's going to get rid of the wicked people out of the land when he sets up his kingdom. And it says, But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. That's those wicked people at the second coming in there in Hebrews 6, 8. Hebrews 6, 9. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, 
and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So on another note, if you're a Christian, then there should be some things that accompany your salvation. Once again, not to stay saved because you can't earn your salvation. And this ain't to even prove you're saved. It's just the fact that a Christian should maintain good works, as it says in Titus 3.8. You ought to maintain good works every day. Have good works for the Lord. Hebrews 6.10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. God won't forget the things you have done for him on this earth. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So in Hebrews 16, he says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. He's not going to forget what you've done, which ye have showed toward his name. Was it to his name or was it to make your own self a name? You know, the motive has to be there. You've got to have the right motive. And that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So God won't forget what you do toward his name. So make sure it isn't to make your own name. If you lift up Jesus Christ's name, then the Lord will promote you. He will make you a name for lifting up the name above every name. Now the saint in the tribulation needs to make sure he is keeping his mind on the name of Jesus Christ and not falling for the name of the beast. And the work that needs to accompany the tribulation saint is abstaining from the mark of the beast. Hebrews 6.11 And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. I can look at this and say to myself, I need to have motivation to work for the Lord until the rapture. That's my hope. That is the practical application for me for this verse. Now, doctrinally, for the trib saint, the way he should look at this when he reads it one day and say he needs to hold out for God until the end of the trib. Because when you search the phrase, the end, it's referring to the end of a certain time, not the end of a person's life. And if you go to Matthew 24, the end... That's referring to the end of the tribulation. So it says, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That tribu tribulation saint is going to have to endure to the end without taking the mark of the beast or die early as a martyr. But that mark of the beast, that's what gets people. They, don't, they want to say, you know, well, God will... God just won't let them take the mark of the beast. Okay, is there a sin that God has just forced people not to do? Think about it right now. Is there any sin that God's forcing you not to do? God gives man his own free will. He's going to give a man to choose him or choose the beast. He's going to give, give you that option. God's not going to make you do anything. Hebrews 6.12 says that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So God doesn't want us to be lazy. What you have today is a bunch of evil workers and a bunch of lazy Christians who are slothful. It says that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You need to read your Bible and practice what those Old Testament saints did who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Learn by example. The whole Bible is for us. It's for our learning. Hebrews six thirteen through 15 For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so, and so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So Abraham believed God about his seed. He was an old man, his wife was an old woman, but he still believed God that God was going to give him this, uh, this. His seed would be as many as the sand on the sea. And the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. As it says back there in Genesis and in Romans chapter 4. But the Jews who endure patiently in the tribulation which is a completely different time than we are in now, they will also inherit the promised land in the millennium. 
and the Christian in the church age who is spiritually neither Jew nor Greek will reign over cities with Jesus Christ if they continue in the faith. A Christian can go through his Christian life and never do anything for the Lord, and he'll still make it to heaven. He'll never lose his salvation. However, when he gets to the millennial kingdom, he won't be reigning with the Lord like the saints who lived for him while they were here. You see, you want to live right even though it's not saving you. I mean, you want to live right because you love the Lord. You want to live right because you're going to get reward for it. Hebrews 6, 16, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. So Paul said, Men verily swear by the greater. Who's greater? God is. That is why you hear people taking the Lord's name in vain. They swear by the greater. They want to add authority to what they're saying, and deep down they know God is the final authority, so they say, God blanket. Uh, men verily swear by the greater. And then Paul says, And an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Now today, the last days of the church age, you have truce breakers, as Paul talks about in 2 Timothy 3. You don't know what people are going to do. You can't take them at their word. But there in Hebrews 6, 16, Paul says an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. But you can't take anybody by their word today. Hebrews 6, 17, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise <coughs> the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. So the heirs of promise, that's the born-again believers who put their faith in the gospel and get it on the, in, in on the promises. They get in on the promises through Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So we're in God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of, of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that immutability of his counsel immutable means it doesn't change hebrews six eighteen that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for god to lie we might have a strong consolation who hope or who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us so the things that are immutable are the promises God gave to Abraham. It was an everlasting covenant that Abraham and his seed would get the land. Nothing can change it. If it did change, then God told a lie, and it's impossible for him to lie, as we know from the Bible. Hebrews six nineteen, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, in which entereth into that within the veil. So if you're a Christian, then Titus 2, 13 shows you that your hope is the rapture when Jesus Christ meets you in the air. For a tribulation saint, his hope is Jesus Christ coming to get him on the when he steps foot on the ground at the second coming. His hope is the second coming when Jesus Christ comes in the millennial kingdom. So our hope, Jesus Christ, is the one who entered into that within the veil. And he applied his blood up there in heaven and gave us eternal salvation. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, that's Jesus Christ, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil, that's Jesus. Hebrews 6.20, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, you see, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So once again, talking about this man Melchizedek, comparing Jesus to that man. So why is he after the order of Melchizedek? It's because Jesus Christ had to be made a high priest to Gentiles so that Gentiles could get in. And that's what Melchizedek was, a high priest to the Gentiles. So he's after the order of Melchizedek. because Also because Melchizedek was better than the Levitical priesthood, and Jesus Christ is a greater high priest. He's even a greater high priest than Melchizedek himself. But this has just been a quick verse-by-verse verse study of Hebrews chapter 6.